uh, Sam from Crash Course Hemet here, and today I'd like to take a moment of your time to talk about English Sword and Buckler. Now, firstly, we need to understand what exactly is English Sword and Buckler. And we have no idea, basically. There is no surviving manual that specifically speaks about English, or really for that matter, even Scottish or British sword and buckler styles. And yet, it is referenced almost continuously. Everything from prize fights from uh, the master or the company of masters of defence in uh, London, all the way to plays frequently bemoaning how there are no good sword and buckler men uh, wandering around anymore, um, and even to statutes in the law specifically telling people how big or how pointy their bucklers can and can't be. Tangent time! The proclamation of Elizabeth I limited the spikes on bucklers to about two and a half inches or something like that, so around five or so centimetres, and if they were any longer than that they weren't allowed. This is funny because when you look at surviving Welsh bucklers, some of their spikes are way, way, way bigger than that measurement. And what is incredibly funny is that by the time the buckler dies out and is replaced with the dagger, if we can say it dies out, and then eventually the dagger dies out and it's just replaced with, say, small swords and sabres, spadroons and backswords and that sort of thing. All you have to do is travel north of the border to Scotland and what do some targes have on them? That's right, they have a giant spike sticking out of the middle of them. Okay, sometimes they were added later, some may have existed at the time, some are screw-in, some are permanently fixed. So I think it's quite interesting that you see this little <laughs> you see this little evolution where no, you're not allowed to have a big spike on your buckler. You shouldn't do it, okay? We're going to make a law. Promptly ignored by everyone. Eventually the buckler falls out of favour, but that sort of tradition follows all the way to the north, and before you know it, people are using shields strapped to their arm with big spikes on them. Pretty cool, eh? So, for something that frequently cops, crops up in British and English literature, versus, say, on the continent, where something like sword and dagger and rapier and dagger just immediately took off, or in places like Germany where something like the longsword or messer was generally the rule. It's funny that in Britain, for something that is so frequently spoken about, there is no surviving manual on it. Now, this is one of the points I want to bring up. There is no manual about it, like 133 or Litziger or any of the Bolognese stuff. Okay, there's no equivalent manual. However, that is not to say that there are not, subsequently, the references to it and its use. What do I mean by this? Simply put, we can piece together, I believe, a functional system of specifically English sword and buckler, and to an extent Scottish sword and buckler, okay, that was used with a basket-hilted weapon, whether a broadsword or a backsword, okay, so some sort of complex-hilted weapon. What I've got here is sort of my current working interpretation, and I'm just going to go through it, and I'm going to try to back up all my statements with evidence. Open, bastard, outside, true guard, okay, lazy guard, Portuguese guard, okay, head guard, and double to either side. They are either derived from primary sources, okay, or evidence-based. Um, things like Wigden Howe, pictorial references, which are never, ever, ever a primary <laughs> resource, all right, or shouldn't really be used as a primary resource because they're just rife with problems, okay, but 
we're going to do it anyway because I'm lazy and I'm not a good academic. Without further ado, we'll get started. So, what do we know of English? And we're going. To, I'm going to keep saying English, but really you can just supplement that for Scottish or British or Welsh or Irish or any sort of anything like that. Sword and buckler. What are the things we know? Firstly, coming from George Silver in his Paradoxes of Defence, we know that all double weapons, so the sword and dagger and sword and buckler being a double weapon, have eight wards. This is interesting because tangent time, what we see across a lot of sword and buckler treatises, all right, including 133, everything from 133 to Litziger to, um, to Bolognese stuff, is that sort of eight positions tends to be about the same thing. Oh, but Litziger only has four, you say. Well, not quite. This, what they are doing is they are sort of, <laughs> what's the word I'm looking for? They're pretty much doing what Kano did to judo, which is they're trying to sort of condense it into the top four or the key positions that you might naturally take. Degrassi, for example, does something very simple. He says there are only three positions. Well, there aren't only three positions, are there? Because you can have both a left leg forward variant and a right leg variant forward. You can have it on one side, your weapon on one side, or you could have your weapon on the other side and subsequently the mutations and combinations of all those things. So, as a rough rule, say using Litziger's buckler again, sword and buckler, there are only four positions, but you can do both of those on each side. Okay, I can have ox here and I can have ox here. That's two positions. I can have ox with my right leg forward or my left leg forward. That's two positions again. Okay, so really you've got eight positions. With Bolognese system, and I'm going to sometimes call it Bolognese because I'm not very good at speaking Italian, there are... Uh, da, 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 da. There are 15 to 16 separate positions. <laughs> However, those positions aren't necessarily because of a difference in the hand, rather they're a difference in the legs. So, if we just counted the hand positions, all right, again, you'd wind up with about eight, okay? So, this is where we sort of get into this interesting discussion of how few can you get away with, and how many do you really need? Oh, and of course, I-33 has seven, uh, seven custodi, so seven basic uh, wards that apparently the priest says that everyone who doesn't know how to use a sword and buckler automatically takes up. They just automatically do it. They already know this, even if they haven't practiced. And it's the obsessio that are the ones that are specifically designed to break the custody. Again, I haven't done enough sword and buckler or 133, I should say, to really comment on that, but of course I'm sure, um, you know, David Rawlings and, and Roland and all those other people, you go watch them and I'm sure they'll bring up a few other points that I've probably missed. So, Silver's assertion that there are only eight wards for sword and buckler works. Okay, so we can work with that. There are only eight positions. Yes, there are more depending on which leg is forward, okay, but unless Silver or McBain or Macquarie or Miller or Page or McGregor specifically mention a particular foot forward, okay, either due to a um, particular move that's required or because it's optimal or, or what have you, we're just going to assume that it can be either leg forward, okay, for the sake of argument. And if you can't do that, then just assume it's a right leg forward position um, because later backsword and broadsword, generally speaking, starts from a right leg forward position, okay? Although that may not be what Silver intends. He tends to prefer passes. So what are the eight wards of English sword and buckler? Silver says there are two with the point up and two with the point down. Then there are two for the legs with the point down, the knuckles turned downwards, uh, and later he, uh, and in uh, brief instructions, he specifically says that the nail should be turned up. So we know that it's the knuckles on the back of your hand, not the knuckles on the front of your hand. Okay? And I saw that there are two guards with the buckler for the head. 
He says buckler and dagger. But two guards with the buckler for the head. With. That's going to be very important later on. Well, we already have four, basically. And I'm going to uh, grade them in level of confidence <laughs> based on evidence that I've, I have to support them. So first and foremost is outside guard. So why am I so sure that uh, outside guard, or what Silver would term forehand guard, or forehand ward, is one of the positions? I'm glad you ask. <clears throat> because McBain, all right, tells us that This is, of course, also backed up a little bit later with James Miller, who says... And, of course, Page, who, whilst specifically mentioning the Targe, it's interesting to note that in Scotland, the sort of Buckler and Targe kind of have a weird similarity. Page says... So, yes, Silver doesn't specifically say a outside guard. He says, generally speaking, a forehand guard. However, we know forehand is roughly a sort of medium position, and we also know that medium, generally speaking, can be turned to an outside or turned to an inside as is required. Okay? So, we also see this position, or a similar sort of forehand position, could be found in something like staccata, Okay, with the hand withdrawn back. Uh, and we see these positions, or similar, various varieties of these positions, across all the sword and buckler traditions. So, I'm 100% confident and 100% certain that one of the point-up wards of English sword and buckler is outside guard. That's not to say you can't use things like staccata or passata and that sort of thing. Of course you can, absolutely. But for the sake of argument, that's based around the rapier fight, not so much around the backsword or broadsword fight. That's a whole other discussion, and I'm probably going to do a whole series of videos regarding this, depending on how interested people are in order to reinforcement back up my assertions. Anyway, moving on. The other point up position, I believe, uh, so of the two point up positions, is open fight. Now this is curious, because open fight has no equivalent in later backsword or broadsword manuals. It exists in silver, it exists as guardia alta in, uh, in Italian traditions, it exists as a sort of variant of Vaughan, uh, Zornhau, Vaughanhau, Zornhau, or Von Tag in German traditions, okay. And it even exists in a sort of variant in uh, I-33. Okay. So this is an interesting commentary on why people believe Silver's system tends to be this weird fusion of medieval, sort of medieval and Renaissance-esque uh, and ultimately later, even Jacobean, early modern, uh, fencing, which is quite interesting. Anyway, I believe that one of the positions is open fight. We have enough sources from other traditions to indicate this. However, someone might rebut that it doesn't exist in later backsword and broadsword manuals. Okay? And I agree. I can see that that is true. Open fight still was the only one to use it in that tradition, and then it just disappears off the face of the planet. Um, however, what it is ultimately replaced with is perhaps something like uh, St. George, or um, you could say it was sort of superseded by um, hanging guard, or the sort of extended forward hanging guard, because functionally they are similar. One drops down here, this one can kind of do all that, and also cut down from here. So, you know, it's different strokes for different folks, basically. Anyway, I believe that two point up guards in English sword and buckler are open fight, we have enough evidence to support this, and forehand ward or outside guard, specifically outside guard with the blade resting next to, so on, on the rim or slightly in front of the buckler. 
except for some people who say the sword should be behind the buckler, but that's a tactical that's that's a tactical choice, less of necessarily a strategical choice. Oh well, no, not necessarily. We'll talk about that in another video or later on in this one. Anyway, what are the two point down guards that he specifically mentions? One of them, absolutely bastard guarded. That's it. Okay, it's, it's not even up for discussion. It's definitely Bastard Garden, also called Inside Half Hanger, okay, which is this position here. We see it in I-33 as Underarm. We see a variant of it in the Bolognese tradition. And we also see a version in the Lichtenhau tradition. So it exists across the board um, and it is functionally similar. So absolutely, I believe that um, Bastard Gardens or Inside Half Hanger is part of English and Scottish Sword and Buckler. The other point down position would be, of course, True Garden. Now, True Garden here has a I don't want to say a direct correlation, but if we look at this picture from Talhofer, it's, it's true guard, it's a hanging guard, okay? Um, or it's a form of hanging guard, all right? And this exists across, again, pretty much every tradition used with a single sword, okay? Especially in things like Mesa, um, side swords and so forth, okay? True Garden is functionally similar to things like, uh, what is it, Sessa Becker, you know, so that sort of high imbricata, um, seconda kind of position. Right. It's functionally similar to that, okay, except it's dropped across this way. Um, and of course it's part of a hanging guard family. So we know it occurs in the manuals, other manuals, other traditions. We also know it occurs sort of in a, in a mutation um, variant across these other things. For example, in Italian sword and buckler, assuming you're not doing um, Dalagocci's kind of detester, okay, it exists in this sort of variant, all right, which is, you know, like, that's, that's the difference we're talking about. It's not very big. And uh, thanks to Chris Thompson's research, uh, and his interpretation of Scottish sword and buckler, uh, buckler the evidence to support, outside of all that I just said, um, in the British manuals, comes from Page, who mentions... So, those that's, that's my supporting evidence, basically, for the first four wards of English, Scottish, Sword and Buckler, which is two with the point d down, which is True Guard, or a variant of a Hanging Guard, you can choose, Bastard Gardent, which is inside half hanger or some sort of underarm position. Again, a variant that you can choose to suit you. Two with the point up is open fight. We have supporting evidence for this occurring and then ultimately it seems to be dropped and superseded. Okay, and a forehand or outside guard position. Again, we have supporting evidence from this, not only within uh, the other traditions, but specifically directly mentioned by uh, British uh, sources.